the warden on the spot and quickly had to cover it up. So these are the two theories. Either he already disliked disliked the warden and he was waiting to get him when he could, or he got one citation too many and just snapped. Doesn't really make a difference which one's correct. I mean, the guy's dead either way, but... They they also said said that um that they thought possibly this wasn't the first time they had he had waited for him to do this hit. Why yeah. did do you did you get anything? Are we coming up to anything that explains why they would think that? There's just just ideas of how this might have gone down. I mean, those really are like the two options. If 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 he had a problem with the warden. And he knew which area the warden patrolled. Yeah, I suppose. It makes sense that he could hide like in a <laughs> yeah. deer stand or something. Police interviewed all known hunters from the area and every poacher who had ever been sighted by Lefebvre. <laughs> I don't know how many that is, but it sounds like a lot. From there, a shorter list of suspects was made and they tried to administer lie detector tests to people. Many of the men complied with the lie detector tests but Husong declined, and he swore that he had an alibi. He was canning tomatoes with his grandmother that day. <laughs> That's a solid alibi. alibi. Yeah. Two twenty-two shells recovered from the murder site were found to be identical to those previously fired by Husong's gun, says a state crime lab ballistics expert. The police already had fired shells and evidence from prior poaching incidents. Metal slugs recovered from the victim's head were found to have rifling characteristics consistent with having been fired from a rifle similar to Husong's. But 100% identification uh, could not be made because police were unable to locate the rifle. They suspected that the rifle was gone forever. In their words, there's really nothing special about a twenty two rifle. So if you just use it to kill somebody, you'd probably hide it somewhere, but it would never be found. <laughs> they did suspect, however, that the thirty out 6 used would probably not be thrown away because that is a valuable gun, and even though it will connect you to a murder, it is not something that you would give, give up. up. Okay. I am not a firearms expert, <laughs> so I just have to take their word for this. I mean, I, I know that like 22s are very common. Mm -hmm. I don't really know anything about a 30 out that's 6. Sick, so, yeah. uh, but that's that's what they're going on here, is that that gun still exists somewhere. Okay. Months after the murder, the district attorney contacted a school friend, Peter Pishek, an assistant attorney general. They believed the answer was to put a wiretap on Husong, which had allegedly never been done in Wisconsin before, except by federal agents. And I don't know one way or the other. So if they say that, that police have never done a wiretap, I believe them. Okay. The Wisconsin Electronic Surveillance, surveillance Control Law was patterned after the federal surveillance statute, um, which had gone into effect not long before. This is 71? Yeah. Yeah, this is 71. And the law went into effect in 1969. So it, it had been on the books for about two years, but it hadn't been used yet. Um, part of the reason that it hadn't been used is they weren't really sure how it would hold up in court. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like, the law says it's okay, but that doesn't mean that a judge is going to agree that it's, it's okay. It. Okay. They were kind of waiting for the right moment to use it. All right. So they had to have a hearing to get the wiretap approved. Um, at the hearing, a police sergeant stated that up to that point, the means of investigation used in the case... Uh, included a search of 40 to 60 acres of the crime scene. They used a metal detector, scientific laboratory testing, stakeouts, interviews with over 200 people, polygraph exams. They said they had used up all available leads. And really, at this point, they were at a dead end. They were like, this wiretap, we're not just, this isn't just fishing. Like, this is our last it's chance. Fine. The wiretap was approved by Brown County Judge Donald Gleason. And then they were extremely lucky. They put the wiretap on Husong's phone, and only two days after doing it... He had a conversation with somebody talking about the murder? Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> Husong called his grandmother, 
and told her not to let anybody see the thirty odd six that he had left with her. <laughs> She assured him that nobody would ever find it. <laughs> a search warrant was issued immediately, and police arrived at the grandmother's house. She at first denied knowing anything, but then said she gave it to her daughter and was escorted to a business owned by that daughter. There, they found the thirty out 6 dismantled into three pieces. Once reassembled and test-fired, the bullets matched the murder bullets, and Husong was arrested. A preliminary hearing was held in January 1972. He was bound over for trial. Uh, in April 1972, the court denied a motion to have the trial moved to a new county. Uh, various pieces of prejudicial evidence were introduced, including articles in the Green Bay Papers, and even an article that had appeared in a national true crime magazine, uh, but the judge wouldn't allow them to move it. This, this is no more coverage than any other case would get. There's nothing really special about this. Mm-hmm. In fact, they uh, started with a pool of 108 jurors, and they really had no trouble getting it down to the necessary number. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't like all 108 were like, yeah, he's guilty. No yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it wasn't as hard to, to get a to get a jury as uh, maybe the defense thought. Right. The, the case went to trial, um, and Husung tried to suppress the wiretap evidence based on the claim that there was no probable cause to request such a wiretap, just a hunch by the police. His argument was that pretty much the only thing that they had was that the twenty two shells were similar to shells that they knew that he had fired. It didn't have a 100% identification match. And he's, the argument there is, if you don't know that those were my shells, you're you, basically just wiretapping somebody you think did it without somebody that you probably did it. You know, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble here. I kind of agree with that defense. I don't know how that, that law is written for wiretapping, so maybe what they did was perfectly legal. It seems like if you want to wiretap somebody, you should have some sort of evidence that, some pretty strong evidence that they're a mm-hmm. uh, real what's the word i'm looking for a real um, yeah i'm thinking of that trying to think of <laughs> yeah but you know what i'm saying yeah i don't know do you have a feeling on that i you do can, yeah. i do i'll get to it okay you're getting to that point i'll get right. to it all right okay so at this point now the trial judge says no i'm not going to suppress it we're, we're gonna moving the case forward uh the next argument and this argument sounds really stupid, but it's actually not the worst argument I've ever heard. Okay. They argued that the only thing that they could show was that he owned the 30 odd 6 The 30 odd 6 was only connected to the shooting of the neck to remove the head from the body. The murder weapon was the twenty two. Okay. So he's like, the best you can do is prove that I shot a dead guy in the neck. neck. You can't mm-hmm. actually prove I was the one who fired the weapon that killed him. Which sounds dumb, because it's not like he showed up, found a dead guy in the woods, and, and blasted his head off. Yeah. Like, that's a stupid argument. But technically, I mean, he's right. Again, Really, they have nothing connecting to him to actually killing the person. Yeah, you know? yeah. But of course, like this wasn't very convincing. Convincing, yeah. Um, and he ultimately he was found guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison. While leaving the court, he said to the district attorney, "I'll kill you, you son of a bitch." <laughs> On the drive to prison, he threatened the officers too, and said that when he got out. Lefebvre's body would look like child's play compared to what he had in mind for them. Wow. Yeah. So he's he's a little cranky. So after um after being convicted, you know, they file appeals and the, the appeals are very very heavily leaning on this wiretap. And he says, you know, this wiretap it it violates the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment saying, you know, the government cannot 
seize things from, from you and basically listening in on your comp.